Good afternoon, everyone. This is the VSIM for Nursing webinar on supporting a successful implementation. My name is Lizanne Fratsky. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Nursing, and I will be your host for today's webinar. And Jeannie Staten is our wonderful presenter today, walking us through some of the implementation steps and helping with some Q&A. Thank you very much. Today, we are going to discuss how to implement VSIM for Nursing and ensure a successful launch. We are going to discuss the different roles that are required with the distribution of codes, as well as explain the different types of codes that are included in the program. We will go through the steps in the distribution. We will discuss the how-to instructions for both instructors as well as students on how to log in and create accounts. Um, from the instructor side, we will review the class management, how to view student results and scores. From the student perspective, we will uh, walk through the scenarios and simulations, how to navigate through the clinical scenarios, as well as access the feedback log. We also will take a moment to discuss the technical support resources that are available for you. So let's go ahead and get started. And first, um, in the implementation of vSIM, there are different roles that are required in, in launching the program. The first you will see is the administrator or the point of contact. This could be your dean, your department chair, program chair, simulation director, um, simulation coordinator, somebody who is the single point of contact to receive the list of instructor and student codes. Uh, we will also um, need instructors, of course, and this is to launch the program. The instructors should be responsible for assigning and distributing codes, administer, creating, and managing the class management process, as well as designating co-instructors and monitoring student scores and progress. Please note that the administrator or point of contact could very well indeed be an instructor but again, these are just the roles that we suggest in order to ensure that successful launch. The third role is the role of a student or user. And note, those are the uh, end users who will actually be receiving the codes to access the program. Um, I, am, I wanted to note that we will pause intermittently throughout the presentation. So if you do have questions, again, please feel free to type those into the Q&A. Um, and we will definitely try to answer all the questions that arise. One important note that we wanted to state is that um, there are two different types of codes. So we did want to point out that the difference um, in an access code would be that actual 12-digit uh, um, code that allows the user to have access to the program. So then again, there's two different types of codes. You've got your access code, and then you have what is called a class code. The class code is what is generated when the instructor creates a class. This class code will allow students to enroll in a course, and that is required so that the instructors can monitor student scores and progress. So again, two different codes. The first is what uh, we will refer to as access codes. These are your license keys that do allow access to the program. And then on the right, we have our class codes, which will then allow students to enroll in specific courses. Uh, the role of the point of contact or the administrator. So initially, as soon um, as the order has been submitted, the way that the school or uh, you will receive your codes is via email, and this will come from our uh, customer service, and you would receive the email with an attachment that will include the actual access codes, as well as a how-to document. This is a uh, PDF that includes instructions on how to get started with VSIM for Nursing. The uh, actual file that's included in that email will include your access codes. It will look something similar to this, where you would have your list of instructor codes as well as your list of student codes. And that is going to be indicated down here in the tabs of your Excel file. The um, attachment that I referred to earlier, the how-to document, 
This is just getting started tips for faculty, and it does go through an overview of, again, what to do in order to get the program started at your, in your program. So uh, we want to go through those steps again. So again, we want to have one point of contact who will receive and distribute the access codes. And then to make things just a little bit more difficult, also note that there are two types of access. Um, you've got your instructors. So this is just the instructor portal, as well as your students. The students have a different access. And the difference between the two is that the instructors will have access and view what the students do, which is the scenario workflow. But the instructors also have access to instructor materials that will include um, scenario overviews as well as the debriefing overviews. So we want to make sure that there's no confusion between the two, that the students are uh, designated for user access and student access and the instructors uh, access does include additional instructor tools and resources to help uh, launch the program. Another note to, um, that's very important is that every user, both instructors and students must have one license per user per module. Okay, so for example, if you have four faculty members and you have adopted three different modules, MedSurge, Fundamentals, and Health Assessment, each of those four faculty members will need three instructor codes, one for each of those subject modules. We will, that also applies to the students. So if you have adopted three different modules, each student will need three different codes because each of those codes will activate access to those one specific subject or module. Let me pause here and ask if there's any types of questions on the types of codes or the type of access. Uh, no questions have been raised yet. So I okay, think you can keep going. Okay, great. And um, I, I also want to note, you might have already seen a lot of this information. We did, um, review this or summarize it in some of our earlier webinars, or if you've had the chance to review any of the instructor materials or videos that are included in the program, you might have already seen a lot of this information as well. So um, these are some suggestions for the distribution of codes. By no means is this an uh, exhausted list, but this is just, again, some suggestions that other programs have shared on how to distribute codes. The first would be that that uh, single point of contact can list, or excuse me, can send the list of codes to each instructor. And then the instructor can then send those codes to the um, designated students. So this could be done via email. So again, it's just a manual step of listing the codes in your email and then sending those forward uh, to the students. Another option would be to use an Excel file to mail merge and send um, a template, a Word template with instructions, and then using the Excel file to merge the codes into that email. Um, that, again, is another suggestion. If you have multiple codes and you do have a large number of students, this would be a great a recommendation. The third option is to create a class roster in Excel. Um, then you would copy and paste your codes into the Excel. As you see here under each subject, you would copy and paste each of the codes. This will assist if you have a large number of students and you have a, a large number of codes that uh, can be assigned to each student. Once you populate the Excel file, you can just copy this row here and then um, email that to your students. So again, this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but it is some just suggestions on how to distribute codes. Next, let's go into the instructor registration and access. So once the instructor receives instructor codes, these are the steps to follow in order to get access to the program. Uh, once you go to the point website, um, and I do want to note that these instructions are included in that email that is first sent out. But again, we're just going to review this uh, 
just to make sure everyone does ensure, of course, a successful launch. But coming in either as a new user or a return user, the instructor would then select new user. Um, if there is not an account on the point as of yet, they would enter the access code seen here. They would then go through the series of steps of completing an account, which would include your name, your address, um, uh, what role you have at the institution. And once you have completed those steps, you will then receive confirmation that you have access to one of the titles. Uh, if the instructor has uh, established an account on the point already, they can come in as a return user. And this is where uh, instructors will then log in using the email address and password. And I do want to point out if anyone does uh, need password help, there is a forget your password link listed here under the return user. And once you click on that forget your password, the system will then email you a, a system reset. So that's there available for both students and faculty. But again, the instructor will log in as a return user. And then this homepage is where the instructor would enter the code that was then sent to them. So that access code would then be um, entered by clicking on this add a new title, the system will prompt the instructor to enter that title and then it will activate access to that um, specific module. I want to note that this is the step that would be taken after the user, whether it's an instructor or a student, creates an account. Once the account is established, this is the step that would be required to enter multiple subjects. So once again, once the account is established and you want to enter um, a med surge and health assessment and fundamentals, each time you log in, uh, excuse me, you just have to log in once, but you will have to add a new title and enter those separate codes. So the step would be um, clicking on that add a new title would then prompt for that 12 digit access code. And then again, once you enter that code, you would receive confirmation that the title has been activated. I will uh, note here uh, several times we've had the question of um, when does active, excuse me, when does access begin? The day that that user, whether again you're an instructor or a student, activates the code, this is where your 90 day or if you're uh, using the standard year long access, the day that you activate the code is when your access begins. Any questions so far? Okay, so uh, someone has asked, if I teach for two schools, do I need a separate account for each school? Yes, that's a very good uh, valid point. Your account is tied to your email address, which will then tie you to the students enrolled at that school. So if you have another set of students, um, unless you want to view them in one portal, I would uh, recommend using two different email addresses to keep your students um, in separate uh, accounts. Now, if it's different sites, but you're still at the same institution, uh, you can very much use your same initial account. Okay, great question. So I'm going to move on again, and then if there's any other questions, just let me know. Once the instructor is logged in, this is the instructor portal. Uh, two things that we really want to note here is, again, the instructors have access to a downloadable user guide. This provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the program, what the program um, entails, how to navigate through, how to interpret scores. So this is a really thorough um, resource here in the instructor user guide, as well as the um, getting started training video. These are self-paced modules that the faculty members, you can um, have your clinical or your adjunct faculty view these videos and then um, they will be able to get started and launch the program themselves. So this is a comprehensive but a very intuitive way for um, other faculty to be able to um, learn about vSIM as well as help launch and implement the program here. 
Then like, we're going to move into class management. This is where each instructor would create a class and creating the class is what step is needed in order for you to be able to view and access the student scores as well as their feedback logs. And this is done through the My Classes link at the uh, right of the page. You see My Classes in the green link. This box will then take you to the next site, which is your mini LMS. This is what I call, I call a mini learning management system. So you have your list of courses here. So someone who had asked um, earlier about having different courses, um, you can create different classes here and you can designate the difference by the name or um, perhaps what section. If you have different clinical groups, you can call them, um, again, just the naming schema is up to you. You can name uh, if you've got multiple courses, if you have three sections of med surge, you could have NUR uh, you know, 211, you could have a section A, a section B, and a section C. So this is uh, what is in included in the program to keep sections of students separate. And this is for you to be able to access, again, just these different cohorts. Uh, the way that you would create new sections within vSIM is selecting the add a new class function. And this will prompt you to complete the uh, fields, again, to create a specific class. Here is where you would enter the name of your institution. As you can see on the screen, I've typed in the word university. And when I do that, because this field is auto uh, populated with different schools, as soon as I typed in university, I had a host of, list of schools that populated. What you want to do is select which school is yours. And you would do that again by just typing some of the, I mean, the first few letters of your institution name. I will ask, um, a lot of times we've seen some uh, schools that may not show up on first attempt. And here is where uh, we suggest that typing uh, differently, maybe typing out Saint instead of ST. Or here you see on this example, the second uh, school name is A space T space Still University, but it's also listed as A period T period Still University. So you might want to try a couple of different combinations um, in order to find your institution. If you have any issues with this or run into any type of problems, just let us know and we can facilitate um, adding a school if needed. So as soon as you include the name of your school, you'll be prompted to then select the program type, class name, section, time, term, and location. And once you've completed that, the system will generate a unique class code. And this is the code that you will provide your students that will then prompt them to enroll in your course. So at the beginning of the presentation, when we said there's two types of codes, the first type was an access code. And the second type um, is seen here. This is your class code. And again, this is what will uh, allow you to view your students' uh, progress as well as their scores. So if your student is not enrolled in your course, you will not be able to view their progress. So it's very important that you um, communicate to your students that they need to enroll in your course. Was there a question about that? Um, not any unanswered questions right now. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Um, so again, this is something you might want to note um, when you communicate to your students that they will then have access to vSIM. They will, um, the second step would be to activate uh, or create an account, activate access. The system itself will ask the students initially if they want to enroll in a course. And this is the class code that is required. Um, one suggestion is that you can copy and paste all of this information in this gray box once you have generated your class code and you can paste this information into your LMS for your one specific course, uh, maybe in the course content, and then the students as they go through the instructions of activating um, or creating an account, activating access, and then they will then know which code associates them to that specific course. 
Once you've created a class, you will then have a list of classes. As you can see here, I've created many different classes. The way that I can access the students that have enrolled is by selecting the view of each specific class or section. Uh, one way to confirm that you have all your students enrolled is under enrollment. That will show you the number of students that have enrolled in that course. And you might want to just cross check that with your roster to make sure all students have enrolled in the course. But you are able to access the class. So when I click on view, I would then see my roster of students. So for this one clinical group 10, I see that I've got my students listed. Um, I can then access individual results for each vSIM by selecting uh, the view results listed next to their names. I can also um, access through a macro level of seeing all my students' um, completion and their highest scores through the vSIM results, and that's what we will definitely go through. Um, there is another function here for co-instructors. So if you are the course lead, and you create the MedSearch course, and you want to add additional faculty members to have access to this cohort of students, you can select the co-instructor link shown here, and it will prompt you to email, to enter the email address of any co-instructor that you would like to designate to have the same access as you do. Uh, for that question earlier of the person, if you are um, if you do have different locations, multiple locations, and you want to be able to view the progress of different cohorts at different locations, you can share this access with your colleagues. Um, and so all of you can have access to the, different, to the different students and you can compare. You know, you could see the standardization across the board from different locations. Or if you had um, adjuncts that were helping you with um, documenting the clinical time for these students, you can add them here by selecting, um, by simply adding them as a co-instructor, it will email the instructor, the instructor receives the email, clicks on the link, and it adds them as a co-instructor. So here um, you can see, these are all of the co-instructors that I have added to this one specific course. Down here under the pending invites, I have sent an email to these faculty members, but they have not yet accepted the invitation to be a co-instructor. So again, this is really helpful, again, if you have adjuncts or any clinical faculty, or if you also have, again, different uh, locations and you want to be able to view different cohorts of students. Um, going back to my roster, if I select the vSIM results, this is going to allow me to have a more um, macro level view of my students and make sure that they have um, completed the assignments. This is going to give me access to their highest achieved score. So when I select vSIM results here, it takes me to um, the one specific, uh, or I can, excuse me, I have my list of different scenarios. And when I select one of these specific scenarios, it's going to give me the uh, highest achieved score from those uh, students. So I select Jennifer Hoffman. Here's my list of students. And what I'm looking at here, again, is the highest achieved score that has been achieved by each of my students. Um, this also gives me a macro view of, of completion. So for example, I've asked the students to complete the Jennifer Hoffman case and achieve at least a 95% benchmark by next Tuesday. So in the workflow for students, they will have to complete the pre-SIM quiz. And what I'm looking at here is this check mark indicates whether or not the student has completed the pre-SIM quiz. If he or she has not, then there is not a check mark here. So out of these students, the only one who's completed pre-SIM quiz is student number 10. Again, this is my highest achieved score, so this tells me whether my students are on pace for completing my assignment, which again, I indicated at least a 95%. And so I can uh, tell here where students have, again, are they on pace? Here's one who may be struggling, so I might want to intervene. I might want to contact student number 13 and ask, you know, are there any issues, are there any challenges, what is it that I can help with? 
um, because you uh, only have a few more days to complete the assignment. And I see here that you're only up to a 37%. Uh, these X's here indicate the, the number of errors made in the scenario. So for this highest achieved score here at the 79, what um, this uh, view is telling me is that this student made three single X errors uh, the number of errors indicate the severity of the error. So again, two errors would be more severe. And then my triple X's are those critical errors made that can cause severe patient harm. So for again, this one student here, highest achieved score is a 79. And this student uh, made three single X errors in the scenario. Here, student 10 has completed the pre-sim quiz. Highest achieved score is a 61. Here's the number of errors. This also provides the post sim quiz score. So in that workflow, the students will be assigned a post sim quiz and it is a graded quiz and you would receive the uh, percentile of the, or the outcome of what the student achieved on that post sim quiz. But if I click here on this 61, this is what takes me to the student's feedback log. And this is where I can see the details of what was uh, completed in the scenario. This is the clinical decision making of this one specific student in this uh, specific Jennifer Hoffman case. So if I needed to have the documentation of what was done in the scenario, I can again access the feedback log. The student has access to every attempt made for every um, scenario. At the, uh, this cut off in the, um, in the full screen. However, in the feedback log at the very bottom, it does provide the total amount of time that was spent in the scenario. So all of those attempts that students make in vSIM is documented as in down to the uh, number of minutes and seconds spend, spent in each scenario. Uh, next, let's go over the Instructor Access Portal. This is the uh, landing page for the faculty member for uh, one specific module. So what we're looking at is vSIM for Nursing Med Surge. On the left, um, the instructor is able to view what the student sees. So again, the student, um, you can see that the student has uh, student user guide, vSIM tutorial, there is a learning community, and there's also the ability for students to get to their entire history. So this is just providing a view of what the students see. For faculty members, this is the instructor um, resource guide. So you do have um, resources that help launch the program, which are included again, we showed you the user guide as well as the videos, but there's also instructor tools um, in the scenario overviews, as well as scenario debriefing guides. Um, so emphasizing that simulation has to be good quality simulation that does include um, quality debriefing. So we do provide the guides in order to do that. Um, we also provide the overviews that will allow faculty to plan or to map any of the content from the scenarios to um, existing lesson plans. So here are, this is an example of an overview. This provides the instructors, uh, the objectives, as well as scenario specific objectives, as well as all of the details of the scenario. What are the orders, as well as what are the diagnosis. Uh, the overview also includes the correct path of treatment that the student must take in order to achieve those high competency scores. So again, this is just, again, an example of a scenario overview, but they are available for each and every uh, patient case. This is an example of the debriefing overview. So again, good quality simulation must have a uh, debriefing methodology. So this is what is provided within each vSIM. The uh, instructor can use the debriefing overview to implement this uh, debrief system. And then there's also a guide for the instructor to use in order to foster classroom um, discussion. Um, so we will discuss towards the end of the presentation some different suggested practices of implementing this um, into your program. 
But again, please just note that these are available for each module. And I do want to note that all of these tools that are included are very specific to the module. So the tutorials that are there for your students, um, I would we suggest that you uh, let the students know that it's vSIM Med Surge. So the vSIM Med Surge mod, uh, tutorials are very specific to the Med Surge. So they do define the tabs that are in the Med Surge program, as well as these debriefing guides. Again, they're very specific to the module itself. So it's important to um, really explain this to both faculty and students that the tools that we built in are really going to help ensure that successful launch. Let me pause before we go into the students and ask if there's any additional questions. Um, there was one unanswered question that just came in is, can students print out their debriefing detail results after completing the scenario? Oh, that's a great question. There are two portions of the student workflow that are actually printable or downloadable. And that is the answers to the debrief questions or the reflective questions, as well as the documentation assignments. But as we go through this, I do want to note that the reflection questions for the students as individual practice is different from the debrief guide that is there for faculty members. So even though the assignment is made, the student uh, goes through this uh, simulation workflow, and that is really made for um, the students to complete in a self-directed learning module. So we want students to go through the whole workflow and complete on their own. But then when they get together in maybe a synchronous meeting, a virtual meeting, the debrief guide on the faculty side can be used to foster discussion. So I will point that out. That's a great point. But the students, um, you know, that's going to be two really two separate um, steps in the learning process. Um, and another question, um, just a couple came in, so I think we might just um, review them um, just live. Um, are these written at RN or LPN, LVN level? Good point. Um, we recommend, oh, let me back up. VSIM for Nursing was developed for the undergraduate nurse. So all of the content really does focus on the core nursing curriculum of the undergraduate nurse. Understanding that every state is different from the LPN or LVN curricula, that uh, some of the scope of work in some of the modules may be higher level for um, LPNs. What we recommend is that the fundamentals and the gerontology and the mental health modules we have been, we have seen, and other programs have shared that those apply best in an LPN program. Not to say that they don't work in a BSN uh, or ADN program, but that's where we've seen that that scope does fit or align to the LPN scope of work. So those three modules, again, were fundamentals, mental health, and gerontology. And I don't know if you um, mentioned this specifically, are the scenarios or guidelines printable? Are the scenarios, the overviews and debriefing um, guides? Yes, those are downloadable and printable. Good question. Yes, they can be. Okay, I think that's it so far. Okay, excellent, thanks. So th this is a review of what the student would see to log in, it is exactly the same as instructors. So the students would select whether uh, to log in as a new user or a return user. If uh, the student is new to the point website, they would select new user, they would enter the 12 digit code, they'd have to create an account, and then they would receive confirmation that uh, the registration uh, and access has been successful and they now have access to this specific title. If they are an existing user on the point website, they would log in as a return user and then they would go through those same steps of adding a new title to their content. That would be those access codes and depending on the number of modules is how many times they would add the different titles to their content. So once the student has um, selected new title, they enter the code and then they would receive confirmation that they now have um, access to this one specific title. 
So once the student has completed those registration and activation steps, they would then begin the workflow that's included in the program. This is one important step that we just, we can't emphasize enough is that for students, um, there is a user guide. This is downloadable. And there is also that vSIM tutorial. What we have found one of the most um, useful functions of vSIM is how intuitive it is for students. So launching vSIM, what we have found is uh, one of the most favorable parts of it is that it really is easy. Um, for you as faculty members, we suggest, again, communicating to the student, make sure you view this tutorial and it is custom to each specific module. So the vSIM tutorial for med surge is different from the vSIM tutorial for maternity. And it does outline the tabs in each of those programs. So again, it's very important that students view this tutorial. Once they have accessed the student resources, they can then get started on using the program. Uh, the first step that they will be um, pointed to do is to enroll in a course. And the way that they enroll in those courses, and remember that's an important step in order for you to be able to view the student scores, is that the student enrolls here by selecting my classes. Uh, they will then be prompted to join a class. And once they select this option, they will need to enter a class code. This is that second type of code that we've referred to earlier. This is the class code that you generated. This unique code allows the student to enroll into your one specific course. And again, this is the step that allows you to view their progress. And once the student has entered the class code, he or she will receive confirmation that it's been successful. Um, and then it states to the student, this is the course that you've enrolled in. And once the student has enrolled, he's ready to get started. Um, this is the student portal. The uh, student has the ability to access their entire history through my results. There again is the user guide and the tutorial, and then the list of scenarios are listed on the right. Once you have made that assignment, you must complete the uh, Jennifer Hoffman case by next Tuesday. The student would log into his or her account and then click on whichever scenario or assignment that you've made. So you can refer to the assignment as the patient name. Again, so complete the Jennifer Hoffman case and then the student will uh, begin the workflow. And this is where they start on step one and they go through the workflow, the pre-SIM quiz, the actual scenario, post-SIM quiz, documentation assignments, as well as the guided reflection questions, this is the workflow. So here on step one, I did change this. Um, the suggested reading that is appended to every scenario does include links to Lippincott Procedures and Skills or Lippincott Advisor, just depending on what the link is. But uh, for this example, I wanted to note, this is the VSIM Fundamentals. There is the Jared Griffin case and included in the reading assignments for this one specific case is the um, isolation garb, donning and removal. So you've got your PPE uh, donning and doffing steps in the, uh, with this one case, specific case. And it does, it was updated with the CDC's recommendation uh, for COVID-19. So uh, again, this is really important. We emphasize for students to prepare to care for the patients in this virtual setting. We really want them to read the appended suggested reading materials. So again, student starts on one, complete steps two, three, four, five, and then ends with the guided reflection questions. And so someone had um, asked, which was a great question, these are suggested documentation assignments. These are downloadable. The students can complete these assignments in maybe a narrative form and then submit back to the instructor. And that's the same as the guided reflection questions here. Again, it's a downloadable. Uh, the student can complete and submit that back to the instructor. Um, but these guided reflection questions are different than the debrief uh, guide that the faculty ha has access to. This is the workflow um, that comprises the simulation window. And again, this is where we said, uh, based on previous user data, what we have found is that the typical user 
from step one to step six, it's a two hour window. Now, again, that's based on just the typical um, user, but please note that uh, just like everyone, um, all your students may read at different pace, paces, they may go through this window at a different pace as well because it may take them a little bit longer. So those numbers can fluctuate also depending on the number of times it takes to complete the actual simulation. But on the average, this window is what, again, we're looking at is a two hour window. Um, these are some, some suggested synchronous practices that uh, some of our customers have shared with us. And we just, again, we wanna share with you. These are additional activities that you can uh, launch. This is going to add to that simulation window. So now uh, that we have gotten past this putting of our virtual instruction material online and assigning it to students, we may now be at the phase where we're actually meeting online through Zoom or through um, other virtual applications. So if you have your classes meet at a specific time, um, some suggested practices would be to use Internet Explorer versus um, other browsers, but um, you can view the student tutorial together. This may be an introductory um, activity. If you want to introduce your students to vSIM Med Surge, the first time that you roll this out, you could watch this again as a synchronous activity. This is located in the student resources section. Um, and as you have completed viewing this, you make the assignment for students to complete the scenario. And then possibly as um, an after assignment, the students can then um, come back together and you can go through the debrief guide again as um, another activity that's fostering more classroom discussion. So these again, just different activities, suggested practices, but again, it will add time to that simulation window. And I think I saw some um, blinking indicating a question, Lisanne, or if we want to just get through the next two, or do we want to pause for some questions? So there was a, um, a couple of questions that we answered um, based on the contact hours and the, the simulation window. Um, okay. So I don't know if you want to reiterate that one more time. Uh, we did answer them here, but it's obviously a, a very important question for everyone on the on the call. Absolutely. So I'm going to go back and and. and share that from the student side, when they start here at one and end at six, this is a suggested two hour window. And that's because we've got all of our suggested reading here, all of the appended links to the databases, and then taking the time um, to read those and then go through the pre-SIM quiz, the actual scenario, the post-SIM quiz, and the suggested documentation and guided reflection questions what we're stating is that based on previous data that we have collected from um, our uh, past programs that have used BSIM, well, collectively we're saying this is a two hour window, but also note that this is an individual uh, workflow for students. So different students may take longer to read and they may take multiple attempts to complete the scenario. So it will fluctuate from user to user by perhaps you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, and if you wanted to add additional activities to extend that simulation window, you can add these synchronous practices that again will extend every student's um, simulation window because these are done uh, when you meet online. So I hope that covers that again. So this is, you know, you can watch the video. This is, I believe, a 30 to 40 minute video that goes through each of the vSIM modules. And then of course the debrief guide, this can be as ex uh, extended uh, just based on your discussion with the students. How uh, extensive do you want to go through the debrief guide? Do you want to get everybody's input? Do you just want to have some type of discussion? And all of that, again, this would be the um, same practice as you would do if the students were sitting in front of you in the sim lab. These are the types of um, activities that we would suggest that happen in the simulation lab. So that is what's reflected in virtual simulation. We just have to modify a little bit because of the situation we're in. Um, 
Last part are the system requirements of the program. There is a detailed tech spec that is included in the instructor user guide. This is found on page five. So you are able to get to this again once uh, you've ac accessed your account. Go into the instructor user guide, go to page five. These are the system requirements. This is also listed in the student guide as well. But if anyone asks from the technical perspective, what do I need in order to access vSIM? Um, it's really just the most current browsers and the students are able to access from the technical perspective. Uh, there is also the tech support team. Very, very important to let your students know not to contact you for any technical issues, that this tech support team was uh, created to support the digital suite. So if they have any questions, they can um, go to the Point Help Center. This is a very extensive uh, FAQ database. They can type in some select words and it will generate different uh, questions and answers uh, from previous verbiage. There is also the 1-800 number available, as well as the students can email tech support and these are their hours of availability. So again, this team is, is, is very well versed on um, helping students through in term, terms of any technical issues that may arise. So then I'm gonna go ahead and pause for Q&A um, and open it up. You Sam? All right, let's see. Um, students are given time to review the scenarios. Are there different codes for study? Um, let me see if I if I understand correctly. So they are they're given the uh, the assignment and they do have open access to all the scenarios. So they will be able to get or access all of the patients and read beforehand. Um, so I would just be specific for them to say that, you know, this is your assignment. Um, this is the patient case that you must complete. And that's if you're measuring that window, that's how I would begin. Um, you really can't prevent them from accessing the other scenarios. I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, Gloria, um, just type in um, into the, the chat field um, if that doesn't um, answer your question. We don't have any other uh, open questions in the actual Q&A. Um, if there are any other questions, I don't know if, um, uh, and yes, it did answer her question. Um, okay. If there are any other questions, um, you can raise your hand and I will try to unmute you um, to, to ask your question directly. Um, another question just came in, do all of the students get the same scenario? Do all of the students get the same scenario? Well, the students all have access, that access code does provide the students with the same access. So for example, the Visa Med Surge access code will allow the students to access all 10 scenarios in Visa Med Surge. Um, however, it would be for you to assign a specific patient if you only want the students to complete any specific patient case. Um, another question is, is there a, um, debriefing conference call capability on the site um, or has that um, is that done separately? That is an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, no, there's not one on the site. So it would be whatever you have been using or if you haven't been using, we encourage you to explore the different options. Um, you know, just as a uh, public service announcement, there's a Microsoft Zoom, there's Skype, there is Teams meeting, there are, I mean, there's a lot of different um, applications you can use, but maybe your school or IT may recommend one versus the other, but you, you know, any application will allow, you know, at least for your users to log in and uh, meet synchronously. You can even use FaceTime, you know, if your students have an iPhone. And um, there is a question, uh, if you could review um, once more how to add co-instructors. Absolutely. Let me go ahead and I'm going to go directly into the program, Lisanne, so I can show you here. This is Visa Med Search that I have already had up in my um, an account. And this is, I am sharing now on your screen. When I click on my classes, 
it will then allow me to view all of these classes that I have created. When I select any of these specific uh, sections of students, this one is the clinical group 10. There is a link here, co-instructor, and I click on it and it gives me the option to select add co-instructor. And this is where I would type in the email of the person I want to um, send the invite to. So once I have added the email address here, I click send invite, and then that person will receive an email with a link inviting them to join as a co-instructor. Um, any other questions? Let me just, I'm putting someone else's name here. So I can type Jane Barrett at Lairdall.com and then I can send the invite. Oh goodness, I've already sent it to her too. Let me do, um, let's see, who else can I do here? I'll try. So again, I type in an email and then Mary will receive an email and it will have a link included in the body of the message. As soon as she clicks on that link um, to accept, she will then be listed here as a co-instructor to this course. Good question. Any other questions? Um, maybe in general, can you review, um, and I think you've mentioned this before, if, uh, if an instructor would like to have students complete only specific scenarios, not the entire module, that there are limitations with that, um, but that we suggest um, instructors to send out an actual assignment and to note the specific scenario that should be completed. Um, so that, but there's really no um, option of um, blocking students from, from going forward with other scenarios. That's correct. So you would um, post in your LMS a specific assignment. Complete the Jennifer Hoffman case by next Tuesday, um, and uh, your benchmark is a 95%. The one thing, the only uh, monitoring of that that you can do is here are my uh, roster of students, and then I'm going to go to VSIM results so I can see the results of the Jennifer Hoffman case. And when I click here on Jennifer Hoffman, I see my list of students here. The only um, policing of what students have completed is here you can see whether the pre-SIM quiz has been completed. If they have completed the scenario, they will have a score listed here. So this is, um, again, their highest achieved score, but if they've attempted it, there would be something that populates this column. So for any of your others, let me go back here and select a different, maybe um, I haven't uh, uh, assigned Marilyn Hughes. So I can tell the students to complete Marilyn Hughes, but if I click on it, I see here that this student 10 has already completed the Marilyn Hughes case. So this does at least notify me when students have gone in and uh, completed some of the cases, even though I haven't assigned them that case. So it may be um, something that you may want to let students know, do not complete any cases until it's been assigned. You can't turn the cases off, but you can actually see if they have gone in and completed the case. There are questions about the co-instructors. Um, A, do they have to also be registered? Um, and do you have to use the same email that they registered with? That's a great question. Yes, they need to have access. So you can't give access just to anybody. So the instructor would have to have an access code um, initially in order to be able to join the class. And um, they, you must send it to the email address that they used to establish an account on the point. There aren't any other questions. Um, is there any other questions um, that have maybe not been um, sent to the Q&A or the chat window or anything that we may have missed? Um, if you raise your hand um, through the Zoom feature, um, I can unmute you so you can ask. Um, there is a question. Can a student redo a, redo a scenario? Oh, yes. Great question. Students have unlimited attempts per scenario. So what you're seeing here 
is their highest achieved score. So from your perspective, you may not know that it took this student four times to achieve this 52% because this right here represents the highest achieved score. If you wanted the student to submit to you the number of attempts that it took for that student to achieve that 52%, the students can get to their results through my results. They can maybe print screen different feedback logs and submit to you. So if that's something that you want to see from the student, the student would uh, need to um, print proof or documentation of their attempts. And again, they can get to that through my results and then they can submit those to you. Uh, someone asked, the scores seem to be a link. If you click on the link, will it take you to the student's work? Um, it does take you to the feedback log. So um, Jeannie can probably demonstrate. Right, very, very uh, true. So here, if my uh, roster of students, I'm looking at the Jennifer Hoffman case. And if I wanted to see the, uh, if I click on this link, it takes me to the feedback log of this one specific student's attempt in the scenario. So this is where, these are all the clinical decision-making uh, steps that this student made in this case. So I can see here again, here's my timestamp. The green means this was the correct step. Here's those errors that we were, uh, that we viewed earlier. These were the errors made in the scenario. And then here's this timestamp. 13 minutes and three seconds is the total amount of time that this student took in this scenario. I will just pause. There are currently no other questions, um, but I want to make sure everybody has time to type something in if they need it, or they can raise their hand and I can unmute them. If you have um, an additional question or something more complicated or specific to your situation, um, feel free to um, send a message in the chat box um, with your email address and we can have one of our implementation specialists reach out to you directly um, if you have uh, you know a more detailed question or something specific for your institution. I will also add so this uh, implementation session or webinar was scheduled to provide an after the sale type um, steps moving forward so we're thinking that if you have purchased VSIM for your students and you're ready to roll this out um, and implement for the program, that that's where we are right now. But of course, if, if that has not been decided um, and you want more information about that, you're always welcome to reach out to your account manager or your client executive who can uh, review the steps of adopting the program um, and the next steps moving forward that way as well. And I will, um, the, so this session is currently being recorded. We will stop the recording after the session has ended, and then you will automatically receive an email um, after the session. It might take until tomorrow morning. Um, if you need it sooner, um, send, a, I, I see there's someone asking, um, you know, send us an, um, your email address in the chat box, and um, I will send it to you directly. And um, we can, um, I will also send to you, uh, send all the attendees a link to a previously recorded webinar that had more information on VSIM in general. Um, it was one of our earlier webinars, so um, in the chat box, everyone should be able to see a link to YouTube um, that had, um, that had it more general information about VSIM. Okay, um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, I will respond to some of these questions right here, um, but there aren't any questions specific to um, for you, um, Jeannie. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I hope it was helpful, but again, if there's questions or you need additional information, just add that into the chat box and we will make sure the uh, right person does reach back out to you. Thank you very much again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.